Hi, my name is Rachel Kirk and together with my colleague Liz Shred, we're going to talk to you today about investigating allegations. We both work as part of the HR service for schools and academies. In today's webinar, to put it into context, we're assuming you've had an allegation and decided a formal investigation is required and you now need to know what steps to take next. So today we're going to be reminding you of best practice and also giving you some practical tips that you can take away with you. My name's Liz and um, I'm going to just introduce to you what we're going to cover in today's session. Um, so we'll cover the importance of investigations, why would you investigate and the initial principles, the steps that you might need to take to prepare, right the way through to drawing a conclusion, pulling together the investigation report and then through to the final stages including some legal implications as well for you to consider. So why do you need to investigate? It's important to investigate the allegations and the facts of the case thoroughly and ensure a fair process has been followed. Only when a thorough, fair process has been followed can you then move on to drawing your conclusions. We appreciate that for most of you, you will be carrying out the investigation in addition to your day job and it will be time consuming and potentially disruptive, but an investigation will save you time and costs in the long run and help you to defend a case should it actually end up in a tribunal. A flawed investigation may mean any hearing may be halted for further investigation or even a sanction lessened if facts are omitted or unfair. Any subsequent decision could also be flawed or unfair. A tribunal will render a dismissal unfair if you do not follow the ACAS Code of Practice, which sets six principles as fundamental to the issues of fairness. And a tribunal may increase compensation payments by this by up to 25%. And we recommend that you familiarise yourself with this Code of Practice, which can be found on their website. So initial considerations, before you start any investigation, you should spend some time planning and preparing. This will help to ensure that it runs smoothly and is carried out within the right time frame. Um, in terms of the context, the allegations may come from a variety of sources, and I'm sure you're all aware, it could be from pupils, colleagues, or even parents. You'll also need to take into consideration any background to the allegations, as it may have a bearing on the investigation and the outcome. So in terms of asking yourself, am I the right person to investigate this? You need to be satisfied that you have no involvement previously in the matter to date. In most cases, it would tend to be the line manager of the employee, unless, of course, the line manager is a potential witness, then it would need to be somebody else. And so what preparation and planning is required? Well, the first step would be to read and familiarise yourself with the disciplinary policy. It may sound obvious, but I think a lot of people do forget to get this first of all, and ensure that you're aware of the process and the time frame that you need to follow. As part of your plan, consider what documentary evidence is required and whether you need any witnesses. The list of witnesses might also change as you go through the investigation, but at least this will give you a starting point. So what's in and out of the scope? The questions that you will need to ask yourself are, is the allegation clear? Do you have clear terms of reference for the investigation? Who is the deciding manager? And what are the relevant policies? Or do you know which policies and standards have been breached? So you need to get all these together make sure you've got copies of them and familiarise yourself with them. Thinking about when you inform the individual, so the employee should be informed in writing that you're investigating along with details of the allegations and the procedure. But just to note, for any criminal or safeguarding allegation, ensure you first contact your designated HR consultant immediately as they'll be able to advise you of the next steps needed. It's important to remember that it might be that you're asked to hold back on your internal investigation until the police have con concluded their investigation or if the ladder are involved until they've held a strategy meeting. Sometimes, potentially, the police don't actually want you to tell the employee the allegation that you've had in case you might actually alert them and then they go and destroy the evidence. So in all cases, um, be guided by their advice, we would say. Another point to remember or um, think about is if the employee is suspended, ensure you keep them informed of the investigation goes longer than the time frame. So the suspension may also be lifted during the investigation if you find the allegations are not as severe as you originally thought, or the other way around, you may decide that there is a need to suspend if the allegations prove to be more serious as you investigate. In all cases, talk to your commissioning manager, head teacher or HR about your findings for further advice. 
So principles, these are some general principles to bear in mind when investigating. Make sure that you're proportionate and ensuring the investigation is not an excuse to undertake a fishing expedition. It's got to be even handed and reasonable in the circumstances. You need to strike a clear balance between the need to gather the information and the employee's right to be treated fairly and reasonably to ensure there's no breach of the implied term of mutual trust and confidence. You need to also make sure that you keep an open mind and remain impartial and ensure you're not making a judgment. Look for balanced evidence. Ensure you're looking for evidence of both sides of the story and you're not biased. You also need to ensure that you are clear the distinction between investigation and any subsequent disciplinary hearings. Make sure that you read your policy and take time to check the ACAS code of practice because during an investigation there's no actual statutory right for an employee to be accompanied at the meetings. This right only applies to a hearing. However, in many of your policies you might find that you allow for this. It's also important, if, particularly if an employee is distressed, you might want to allow this as a supportive measure or as a reasonable adjustment. Your investigation meeting should also not be conducted as a hearing. So bear in mind, if the employee admits the allegation in the investigation meeting, don't be tempted to decide on a sanction at that meeting. It's not your role as investigating officer. A full investigation should still be carried out. And then finally, just make sure that you ensure confidentiality. Ensure that all your documents and evidence is kept confidential and secure and you are not disclosing confidential information. And likewise, ensure that anyone you need to talk to in relation to your investigation is made very clear the need to keep the details confidential and the seriousness of any breach which, all, which may result in a disciplinary action being taken. So as your role of the investigator, it's important that you remain objective and impartial. You need to be fair and objective to establish the essential facts to reach a conclusion and avoid taking sides. You also need to keep within timescales. Where possible, keep within your policy timescales, but we do recognise that at times this may not be possible due to sickness, holidays, half terms, witness availability, etc. And if this is the case, then make sure that you immediately flag up these delays with the employee being investigated and also that either your decision maker or commissioning manager, which is often the head teacher or principal. Also, if the employee is suspended, ensure that the suspension is reviewed on a regular basis. We normally recommend a month of a review. It is your responsibility to organise and conduct all investigation meetings. So it's your role to arrange the meetings and conduct them. Although you may want to enlist additional support, particularly if you need to interview a large number of people, as it can be very time consuming. And finally, as investigating officer, it is your role to prepare the report and present at a hearing. Ideally, you need to use a template presenting your findings and to be clear, it's not for you to make a decision on the sanction or if the employee is guilty. You may also be required to present your investigation at a subsequent hearing, so make sure that you are prepared to do this. When investigating, you need to bear in mind throughout the standard of proof. Ensure the investigation is reasonable given the time and resources at hand. And when you're investigating, decide on which facts are uncontested and which facts are contested. Overall, you need to be looking at the balance of probability. Look at what evidence you have. Are statements corroborated? Is there written evidence that backs this up? You're not the police at the end of the day who have to have strong evidence before they can conclude. Just a reasonable belief that something has occurred. OK, so moving on to gathering more physical evidence. Um, make sure that you gain permission and follow the correct procedures. Some examples of physical evidence that you might want to gather are computer records, including browser history, telephone records. You may want to speak to your IT department or technician for help collating this evidence. And I should just say, um, before using any personal data, check your policies and contracts to ensure that this can be used as evidence. And if you're unsure about this, then take advice. In terms of documents, it could be things like attendance records, timesheets, particularly in the initial stages, just verifying that they are actually where the allegation perhaps occurred, looking at written reports or training or induction records. And then in terms of all this physical evidence, really scrutinise the information. Does it lead you to any other sources that you might need to look at? So in terms of CCTV and data protection issues, in terms of social media and Facebook, things like that, the important point there is to think about your IT policies and in terms of internal policies to make sure you comply with data protection regulations as well. So preparing for your interviews in terms of the next stage is quite a bit before launching straight to arranging your interview that we just want to go through with you. So notice should be given in writing, ensuring your witness is given notice 
in accordance with your policy, given the right to bring a companion. It might not actually be in your policy, but we would say that it is in general good practice to give this opportunity for people. Preparing your questions and script, it's, it's useful to prepare a script to ensure consistency in each interview. It should include the, the number of things, so introducing yourself, reminding them of the need for confidentiality and any breach may result in disciplinary action, the purpose of the meeting, ask for permission to record if that's what you'd like to do, remind them to answer the questions fully and to the best of their ability. If they do not know the answer, then not to speculate. Remind them that they can ask for an adjournment if needed. In terms of questions, it's good practice to prepare some questions, and we'll go into this in a later point. And then also ask for companion details, and if they've not brought a companion, if they're okay to proceed without one. Practical points in terms of the venue, ensure it's a private room and that you're not going to be interrupted. If possible, ensure that there might be discrete access in and out of the venue for privacy so they don't end up with lots of questions about why they've been in and out to see you. If possible, have water and tissues available and arrange the seating. All of this is in order to try and put the witness at ease to try and ensure you get the best out of the witness and that get the full story as much as possible. For note taking and recording, you probably want to think about if you're going to use a note taker or if you're going to record the meeting. Or another option is to take the notes yourself. But we would actually recommend that you don't try and take the notes yourself if possible in order to allow you to concentrate on the interview and challenge questions as you need to. Okay, so for interviews in general, we should, would say, just to point out, that witnesses should be spoken to and notes taken of their recollection of events before memories fade. So arrange these as soon as you can, really. Stick to the facts where possible to ask for and identify evidence to back up allegations. Check in the dates and times where you need to. Try and avoid them using hearsay or third-hand information or opinions or assumptions. As much as you can, stay calm and neutral. Avoid taking sides and making any judgment on what you hear. And try not to express any approval or even agreement to what they're saying. An important point is to listen and actually give them time to talk. So allow the witness to uncover the story and explain in their own words, uninterrupted as much as possible, whilst obviously keeping them on track, just in case they do actually drift off. In terms of challenging them, you I would say don't be afraid to challenge any inconsistencies so in terms of different witnesses that you've spoken to it could be that the witness might be mistaken or another option is they might have a personal grudge against the accused employee or they may be allowing emotion to actually get in the way of rationality adjournment this can work for both sides really so if the witness is becoming upset or angry you can adjourn to allow them to compose themselves but likewise for you you might need time to gather your thoughts and think about any further questions or challenges that you might want to make to them in terms of types of questions this is a big topic but we would just briefly say think about the types of questions that you may need to use for example open questions or at certain times closed questions might actually be useful and then probing questions if you need a bit more detail. You should be able to ask questions that challenge and test the credibility of the information, but at the same time without intimidating the interviewee. So avoid interrogating them, for example, asking questions, why did you do that? Or leading them down a particular route, for example, do you think he was X, Y, Z? Or multiple questions can, can be confusing as well for people, so such as, what is your role, do you like it and why? Try and actually split those up as separate questions. Then finally at the end, explain that they could be required to attend a hearing and also explain what happens next and check the arrangements for sending out the notes to them so that they can check those, sign them and date them and send them back to you. Remember, only interview people who you can believe can contribute to the facts of the case, not because you've been asked to interview them as well. It's just another little tip for you. Okay, so once you've concluded all your interviews, you then need to make sure that you've got a written record of the interview. So for all of your witness interviews, there needs to be a written statement that's in their own words. It needs to be signed and dated by the witness to confirm that they agree with the notes as a reflection of the interview. And it needs to have the date of the interview was taken as well as the date the statement was signed. And you need to give them the witness a reasonable amount of time to check, sign and return the statement to yourself and obviously factor that into your investigation. 
If there's any disagreement about the statement, then where possible, we, our advice would be to try and agree that with them and agree the amendments if you can. Obviously, if they send the statement back with some changes and you agree with those, then obviously they can be accepted as the final version. However, if the changes are made and you believe they actually contradict what was said at the interview and you're unable to come to an agreement with the individual and any amendments, then both versions will need to be included in your investigation report and a note made. In conclusion of your investigation, just to recap on some of the things we talked about earlier, you need to be objective and remain neutral. Take account of the employee's explanation and don't take sides and, and make sure that you do present both sides of the evidence and you're looking for both sides of the evidence throughout. You need to distinguish between the facts and opinion, consider the credibility of the witness accounts and make conclusions based on factual evidence. Do not use hearsay, gossip, third-hand information or assumptions and again apply the balance of probabilities principle. Get your allegations right. At the end of the investigation you might want to revisit the original allegations and check if they need changing and if so do you need to inform your commissioning manager decision maker which as I said before will be your head teacher principal ordinarily and the employee. Often further facts come to light during the investigation which might require further investigation for clarification or it might need that you need to re-interview the witnesses or interview all the witnesses or revisit certain areas of the investigation so make sure you consider that at this point. So once you've concluded the investigation the next stage then will be to pull together and produce your investigation report. So for those of you that have our HR core service then obviously you can contact us and we have a template that you can use. Alternatively, the first stage probably is check with your HR provider because they would normally have a template. Make sure that you allow yourself enough time. Reports can be really time consuming to write, so you need enough uninterrupted time to produce this, particularly because you probably need to do several drafts of it before you get it right. I think it's important to mention as well that if you do have pupil information in there within your investigation that you gain HR advice before you proceed. You need to check your internal policies and procedures and only interview the pupils if they're absolutely necessary and gain parental permission before proceeding. And if you do interview them and then want to include any of their evidence within your report, you need to make sure that their names are anonymised. Likewise, if an employee wishes to remain anonymous, you need to seek to find out why and give an insurance that any repercussions for giving evidence will be dealt with seriously. If they still wish to remain anonymous, then confirm they may redact their statement of any evidence that may identify them, which generally means that it renders the information completely useless, or alternatively, you can remove the statement completely, which may weaken your case. Ensure when you write the report that you present both sides and the report is not one-sided. And when you're making the case, present the evidence, as we said before, for and against each allegation and including your conclusions regarding if you believe the allegation is contested or uncontested. And if it's unsubstantiated, then you may lean towards a preferred version of events and should mention this providing evidence where you believe this to be the case. Again, reflect on the allegations and breach of policy standards, relook at them and check to see if they still stand as you originally stated or if they might be different. You also need to include any mitigating circumstances that have arisen throughout the investigation that need to be mentioned if they're important. So for example, you might have an employee that's apologised or the employee might be going through a bereavement and acting out of character. And then finally, when you're concluding and making recommendations, to be clear, it's not your decision to decide on the sanction or if the employee is guilty. You need to conclude based on your findings and if you believe there is a case to answer and the case should proceed to a disciplinary hearing or if there is no case to answer, it is dealt with informally. And you can also make recommendations at this point that are required, such as training or you might want to recommend review of policies and procedures. And then make sure that appendices are included, so ensure all the documents referred to are in the investigation and refer to in your report. Okay, so some of the common pitfalls to watch out for during this process are such things as lack of clarity. So ensuring even at the early stages and all throughout that you've clearly set out the allegations breached, ideally breaking these up into smaller assertions in order for yourself and any panel at any subsequent hearing to be able to clearly state which allegations are upheld, particularly if you've got conflicting evidence or some only part of an allegation is upheld, it's much better to have those split out. Breaches of the procedure and policy not identified, so make sure you specify the exact parts of the policy that are breached so that everybody's clear what part you're, you're looking at. 
allegations may change during the investigation so if they do make sure that you inform the employee and also re-interview them to allow them the opportunity to respond. Flawed investigations ensure that relevant areas of investigation are pursued and evidence is not ignored and if there's any delay where possible stick to the timelines and notify the employee and commissioning manager or decision maker of any delays. In terms of witness statements I know we've mentioned this before but just to reiterate because this is a common mistake that people made is make sure that they are signed, dated and that they are an accurate reflection of the conversation. Okay so next steps then are to check your policy as in some cases you may need to present your findings face to face to the original decision maker or commissioning manager. He or she will then need a copy of the report. In the majority of cases they will follow your advice as set out in the report Generally speaking, most disciplinary policies allow for you as the investigation officer to attend the hearing and present your findings. You will then be questioned by the panel or the chair or the employee and their companion. So you need to prepare for being able to be answering questions from each of those people. If an employee appeals a decision at a hearing, you may also be asked to attend to give information about your investigation and again could be questioned by the panel or the chair or the employee or their companion. Finally, if a case does go to a tribunal, you may be required to attend to give evidence and would be cross-examined. Okay, so moving on now to some of the implications and the legal issues to give you some, some figures for the context for this. Although, if you follow your policy and the ACAS code of practice and carry out a thorough investigation, this will try and avoid any reputational damage at a tribunal hearing. For unfair dismissal claims, as you can see there, a compensation award of up to over £80,000 can be awarded. However, this is capped at a year's pay. And remember that the compensation award can be increased by 25% for failure to follow the ACAS code of practice. In addition to this, I should point out that if there are also claims of discrimination, then there's actually no cap to this. And in 2015-2016, um, the highest amount awarded was actually, as you can see there, over a million pounds. There may also be awards for compensation for injury to feelings, which they'll also, the tribunal can award. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.